We all live with expectations, don't we? It's a normal and natural part of life. We all have expectations of different people, whether it's our family. So spouses have expectations of one another. Parents have expectations of their children. Children have expectations of their parents. We have expectations in our workplaces, whether it's of our bosses or our colleagues. Expectations of our friends. Expectations even of our church. We have expectations big and small regarding our favorite sports team, hoping they would win. We have expectations even of the weather. But here's my question. What is it that you expect from Jesus? Maybe I could ask that in a slightly different way. What do you want him to do for you? That's a question that appears twice in the passage we've just read from. First, Jesus asked this question to James and John. And then he asked this very same question to the blind beggar, Bartimaeus. What do you want me to do for you? Now, the way that one answers this question reveals a lot about what we think regarding Jesus, who he is, what he's come to do, and what he'll continue to, to do. I wonder what are your expectations of him? Well, just like this morning, we were looking at the rich young ruler, and the purpose really was that we would come to see that Jesus is more glorious than we've ever dared to realize. And what he offers us in the gospel is more incredible than we've ever entertained. So my purpose for us this evening is to walk through this passage and for us to have our vision of who Jesus is challenged and for us to see that what is offered to us in the gospel is truly incredible. Now what we're going to do this evening is we're going to walk through this passage literally by going on a road trip with Jesus and his disciples. You know, they're on this journey up to Jerusalem. We're going to walk with them. We're going to eavesdrop on their conversation. And as we work our way up to Jerusalem with them, I want us to work our way through this journey in three stages. I want us to listen very carefully to what was in Jesus' mind. What were Jesus' expectations for himself? And then I want us to listen on carefully to what James and John's expectations were of Jesus. And then finally, we're going to listen on and see what blind Bartimaeus the beggar, what his expectations of Jesus were. And if you look down at verse 32, you'll see that we read, and they were on the road going up to Jerusalem And Jesus was walking ahead of them. They were heading up to Jerusalem because it was Passover festival. And there would be a huge procession as they are preparing for the celebration and the the festivities. The place and the people would be pulsating with life and joy. They would be singing psalms like we sang tonight, Psalm 123. Preparing their hearts for worship. But notice that Mark adds this detail. And Jesus was walking out ahead of him. So, so, so there's his disciples, there are crowds behind them, and Jesus is out front. So picture this scene in your mind's eye. Jesus is leading the way. You see, he's not going to Jerusalem merely to celebrate the Passover festival. He's going to Jerusalem to fulfill all that the Passover pointed to. He is the Passover lamb who will shed his blood so that his people can be saved. In some ways, if we were one of the disciples looking ahead to Jesus, everything about his demeanor would communicate to him that this march to Jerusalem was something like a death march. With every stride he took, There was a sense of purpose and destiny. This was the reason for which he came. To 
gave his life as a ransom for many. It's really interesting. We, we, we get the sense that there was a, a cocktail of emotions in the people who were falling behind them. We read there that the disciples, they were amazed. Other translations say they were astonished. They couldn't quite believe it. When they looked at Jesus leading the way, they were astounded at him. But in their minds, there was an expectation that Jesus as the Messiah was about to set, usher in his kingdom. He was about to overthrow the Romans. And then we read that those who followed behind, they were afraid. So as we journey with Jesus and the disciples and the crowds, there's, there's different feelings among the people. But notice what happens next. At some point in the journey, Jesus takes the 12 aside. And here, we get insight into what was going on in the mind of Jesus. The thoughts that were coursing through his mind all concerned the cross. Here is, here's what Jesus was expecting. Look at verses 33, 55. See, we are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes and they will condemn him to death, deliver him over to the Gentiles and they will mock him and spit on him, and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. Notice that every little detail of what was about to take place, Jesus was well aware. He would be betrayed by a friend. He would be handed over to the Gentiles who would put him to death. He knew the process that they would flog him, that they would spit on him. He would kill him. This had been on Jesus' mind ever since he was a young lad and he read the scriptures. All of his life was prophesied and spoken about in the Old Testament. And as he journeys to Jerusalem, you can feel the weight of his thoughts. He knew exactly what was about to happen. Now, you'd think, you'd think, the disciples who are with him, knowing that this is the third time Jesus has actually shared this with them in a very short period of space of time, you would think that they would be really sensitive, really thoughtful. Here's Jesus. He's literally carrying the weight of his people on his shoulders. You'd think they'd be really concerned about Jesus. Well, look, we move from think, looking at the thoughts of Jesus to now thinking what was on the dis, to looking at what was on the disciples' mind. Some point in the journey, James and John drew close to Jesus. Now we shouldn't be surprised at this. They were part of Jesus' inner circle, Peter, James, and John, and now they draw close to Jesus. And James and John are really keen to have a conversation with Jesus. And as they approach him, they say, "Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask." Now just think about it. Jesus has just shared with them regarding his impending death. He's spoken to them about the suffering that lay ahead. And here these disciples, the only thing in their mind is their own interests. Jesus, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. You know, in many ways, the disciples here are a picture of sinful humanity. You know, when we are selfish as sinners, we will easily become indifferent to the concerns of others. You know, when our own needs, wants, desires, and they are first and primary in our life, we will lack a complete self-awareness. I don't know if you've ever been in a social situation and, and you've seen this happen. You know, as a, as a minister, uh, I've been involved with families often in, you know, the most difficult times. So someone's in hospital dying 
quite literally, and the family are gathered around, and I'm there on a pastoral visit to read the Scriptures and pray with them. And I can remember on one occasion, as the family are gathered, as I've read the Scriptures and prayed, this conversation starts. The person I'm there visiting, they're, they're, they're fully uh, awake. Uh, they're a bit con- they, they can understand what's been said. They're not responding, but everyone wants to now have a discussion about their share in the inheritance. It's shocking. But that must have been what it was like on this occasion. Jesus has just shared to them about his impending death. And these disciples, they want to say to Jesus, we want you to do whatever we ask of you. In fact, notice that Jesus, he responds to their question with his question, what is it you want me to do for you? He now wants to expose their spiritual shallowness. Okay, let's let's see what's in your minds. Look at what they ask. Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. So, so, now, we could be too hard on the disciples. The disciples, they, they, they've got a bit of a confused understanding of Jesus. They understand that he is a king with a kingdom. They understand that there is a future glory. But when they think about it, and it's clearly what's in their minds, they want the highest position. Jesus, we want to be at your right hand, your left hand. Please, will you give us that? Just think about how insensitive this was for them. Clearly what Jesus has just said to them regarding his own suffering has gone in one ear and out the other. These disciples were blind. Not to Jesus' future glory, but they were blind to Jesus' impending suffering. Notice what Jesus says to them. You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? If you know the the imagery here, it's from the Old Testament. The cup is a symbol of God's wrath. The baptism is a picture of the overwhelming flood that will be God's judgment. And Jesus says to his disciples, listen, you're thinking about future glory. I want you to be thinking about what is coming. Now, the answer to this question from the disciples should have been, no, Jesus. We're not able to drink the wrath of God, to face the overwhelming flood of God's judgment. But notice what they say. We're able. (laughs) This is the disciples. This is a, a, a classic moment. James and John, we are able Now, Jesus is such a gracious and compassionate teacher. And and he realizes that these guys, in one sense, they they speak more truth than they realize. Because look at Jesus' response. And he said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. The question is, what does Jesus mean here? Now, I think there's two alternative interpretations you could take. On the one hand, Jesus might be saying, guys, you are going to suffer. Not suffer redemptively, of course, that's exclusively for Jesus, but you are going to suffer because you're going to have to take up your cross and you're going to face persecution. That might be what Jesus is referring to. But another interpretation, the one I probably lean to, is that Jesus was saying here, there is a real sense in which you will die with me. You will be baptized with me because of their union with Christ. You see, when Paul unpacks the theology of the atonement, we died with Christ. 
his death was for our, for our sins. And so here's Jesus being very patient and very understanding. Guys, you don't realize what you've just said, but you, the wonder of the gospel is that you will die with me. You will share in my death. You will share in my baptism. And they will also share in his resurrection and glory. Now, Jesus then goes on to say to them, but to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to grant, but it's for those for whom it has been prepared. So Jesus knocks back the requests and he focuses them on their impending suffering. He says, listen, I can't guarantee you the highest positions at the marriage supper of the Lamb. But I want you to be thinking about what is coming in terms of my suffering. So we've, we've looked at what was in Jesus' mind. We've now seen what was in James and John's mind. It's really interesting. At this point in the narrative, we read in verse 41, when the others, the other 10 disciples heard about it, they began to be indignant at James and John. Now, when you read this, you might think they were mad because it was such a crazy request. But actually, if you look at this passage in its context, just back in chapter 9, all the disciples have been debating among themselves who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And so it's most likely that the reason they are so indignant is because they wanted the places for themselves. And here were James and John trying to get in first. You know, it's so easy, isn't it, for us to get mad at other people for doing the very things we often do ourselves. It's one of the strange parts of being a sinner. You know, how, how could you ever do that? How could you say that? And yet we say and do the very same things that we call out in other people. Now, what Jesus does again is he takes all the disciples aside and he now wants to teach them about life in his kingdom. Look at what he says in verse 42. Jesus called them to him and said, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles, so the Romans, they lord it over their people. And their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. So Jesus says, like, if you want to know what life in the kingdom, life as a disciple looks like, it does not look like how the Romans act. Here's what he says, whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus takes my side and says, guys, I don't want you to live like others, like the Romans, like the world. I want your mind to be shaped by God the kingdom principles. You want greatness? Well, greatness is measured by service, not by the number of servants you have and the authority that you have over them. In the kingdom of God, true greatness is not how high up the ladder you climb, it's how low down the ladder you're willing, prepared to go. And by the way, in the kingdom, you don't live with expectations of what glory you'll get you rest in the knowledge that God will give you whatever he chooses to give you. Now Jesus, just to drive this truth home to his disciples, gives us the greatest verse that is in Mark's gospel. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And in that verse, Jesus summarizes what he wants. He wants them to model their lives on him. And notice that term he uses, the Son of Man. The background is in Daniel 7, the unparalleled human being who has authority over all kingdoms, peoples, dominions. The Son of Man who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Jesus says, he came not to be served but to serve 
learn from me. But not only that, he says, yeah, model, but I want you to be filled with the message of the gospel. I have come to be a ransom for many. You know, it was uppermost in the disciples' thoughts was their greatness. Jesus says, do you know what I want to be consuming your thoughts is my death for you. He came to give his life as a ransom for them. He wants this truth to sink down deep into their souls. Okay, so we've seen what was on the Lord's mind. We've seen what was on the disciples' mind. Let's now look finally at what was on blind Bartimaeus' mind. So, so, so they're continuing this journey to Jerusalem. And by the way, they now, we now read that they come to Jericho. This is the last place on the way to Jerusalem. This is 15 miles away from Jerusalem. Remember, Jesus has been out leading them. He's marching every step, every stride. There's destiny and purpose. His mind is filled with his impending death. His disciples are probably still trying to debate over James and John. Why did you try? <laughs> and ask Jesus for glory. And now we read, and as they were leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. Now I love this story of blind Bartimaeus. Let's just call him blind Bart. Here he is sitting by the roadside. It had been, it'd been uh, the, the circumstances of his entire life. A blind beggar. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now what is amazing here is the one who was physically blind, what he lacks in physical sight, he totally makes up in spiritual insight. He couldn't see, but he understood who Jesus was. Jesus, son of David. He's a long anticipated. He is the long promised one of old. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Not only does Bartimaeus understand who Jesus is, but Bartimaeus understood who he was. He was someone in need of mercy. You were getting insight into his expectation. This is the expectation that the disciples should have had. Jesus, we want mercy from you. Not, we want you to do whatever we ask. We want you to give us glory. Bartimaeus had never seen a miracle of Jesus, probably never heard the Sermon on the Mount. But Bartimaeus understood more than his blind disciples. Now, um, as we read on, we're told that many in the crowd, maybe even the disciples, rebuked Bartimaeus and told him to be silent. So, so you've got all these people journeying through. Bartimaeus is crying out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. And now the crowd say, hey, Bart, shut up. Put a lid on it. Zip it. Jesus doesn't have time for you. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. Come on. Be quiet. Go back to your begging for alms, for silver, for gold. Now, I should just ask this question. Isn't it interesting that people, even followers of Jesus, can sometimes be either a help or a hindrance to others following and meeting Jesus? One of the, the greatest tragedies is it's when it's Christians, disciples who get in the way of others meeting Jesus. And so I want to challenge us all with this question. Are we a help or a hindrance in enabling others to meet Jesus. Thankfully, Bartimaeus wasn't deterred by the crowd. He was so aware of his great need that he continued to cry out. He continues to cry out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And here's the glorious thing. Jesus brings the crowds, brings the procession to a halt. Yes, in his mind is the cross. Yes, in his mind is his suffering. Yes, but he also has time for those who cry out to him. Again, question for us. One of the ways you can be a hindrance 
One of the ways you can fail in helping people to come to meet Jesus is that you're too busy to spend time with people who don't yet know Jesus. Jesus had time, even though his death was looming, even though his mind was consumed with thoughts regarding his suffering. He was willing to put the needs of others before his own. Now Jesus says, call him, and, and, and they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he's calling you. Now you can imagine it, right? They've just been telling him to zip it, to shut up. Now they need to say, sorry, Bar, um, he wants to speak to you. Come on, come on, get up. And this must have been a, a brilliant moment for the disciples, especially James and John, because they've just heard Jesus ask them the question, what do you want me to do for you? Now Jesus asks that very same question, but this time to Bartimaeus. What do you want me to do for you? How does Bartimaeus answer this question? Well, he says, Rabbi, let me see. Rabbi, recover my sight. Rabbi, open my eyes so that I can see you, the son of David, the savior of the world. Blind Bartimaeus, you want to know what his expectation of Jesus? Jesus is the one who grants mercy to those who cry out for it. Jesus is the one who's got the life-transforming power to change your life forever. Jesus is the one who can open up blind eyes so that we can see him for who he is in all his glory. Someone has called Bartimaeus the blind visionary. You know, it's interesting, he doesn't beg Jesus for glory. He doesn't beg Jesus for alms. He doesn't beg Jesus for silver or gold. He begs Jesus for mercy and for his sight. See, when it says that Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. You know, in the original, it's got both the idea of your faith has healed you and your faith has saved you. Bartimaeus knew what Jesus had come to bring, salvation for sinners who cry for mercy. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed Jesus on the way. And I love this because Jesus has just said to Bartimaeus, go, your faith has made you well. Go home. Go wherever you want to go. And Bartimaeus with his eyes wide open, says, I'm coming with you. I'm following you. Now, now, just for a moment, indulge me. Bartimaeus had been blind, probably from birth. Doesn't say that, but perhaps he was blind from birth. And at first occasion, he gets his sight. He sees Jesus. And then as he follows Jesus on the way, it's to Jerusalem. And, and what that must have been, the sights, the scenes in Jerusalem at the Passover. But perhaps he's one of those we read about in Mark chapter 15 who followed Jesus all the way to the cross. To where he suffered and died. Bartimaeus is the blind visionary who got a vision of Jesus because he asked for mercy and then out of overwhelming gratitude said, I'm going to follow Jesus wherever you go. I'm going to take up cross, I'm going to deny self, and I'm going to follow after you. And you know, brothers and sisters, his life stands as a testimony to us of how we ought to respond to who Jesus is and to what he's done for us. Let's follow Jesus to wherever he calls us. Let's die to self. Let's deny self. Let's put the needs of others before our own. And let's beg with Bartimaeus. Jesus, it's not your glory that I'm most concerned with. It's your mercy. For me, and for everyone 
who needs it. Let's pray.